All right. Hi, so welcome, welcome, Dr. Talia Machigiani. We are talking today about menopause, mood, and motivation, and how to light up your libido, brain power, and creativity and productivity and motivation. Thank you so, so mm -hmm. much for being with us today. Tell us a bit about yourself and what the focus of your naturopathic practice is and how you can help us women over 45 dealing with all this stuff. No problem. Yeah. So I'm a naturopathic doctor, um, which is a, so we'll start where that, what that means, because yeah. not everyone's aware where a naturopathic doctor is. So in the province of Ontario, we're a regulated health profession. We do a four-year undergrad in the life sciences, and then we do a four-year degree to become naturopathic doctors. And so we're, we're like a, the general practitioner of the natural health world. And we're trained in the biological sciences and in uh, natural healing modalities, such as herbal medicine and nutrition, acupuncture, um, lifestyle interventions. And what we are, what, what our goal is as NDs, our philosophy is to find the root cause of the health concern that our patients are dealing with and to work with them at the level of that root cause and at the level of the individual. So 10 people with low motivation may have 10 different reasons for that low motivation. So our goal is to figure out what uh, maybe lifestyle patterns, what nutrient deficiencies, what hormonal patterns are causing these symptoms. So it actually drives very well with alignment and functional movement because we're trying to solve the problem at the root, right? Instead of just spot treatment, symptom suppression. Um, and so my practice, I'm in, I'm in Toronto, but I work online and my practice focuses on mental health and mood more specifically. And because our mood and our mental health are influenced so heavily by our hormones, I'm also very interested in hormonal regulation and helping people balance their hormones and understanding how hormone imbalances can affect our symptoms. And so today we're going to talk about how uh, hormonal imbalances or how our hormones impact a hormone called dopamine, which is responsible for motivation, mood, drive, creativity, like, and so many other things that we'll get into. Yeah, that is fascinating mm -hmm. because we hear all about when it comes to, you know, any kind of talk about perimenopause or menopause and libido, we're hearing about the sex hormones, right? We're hearing about progesterone, estrogen, testosterone. And then when you mentioned dopamine to me, I was like, oh, you got to come and speak to us about that because uh, <laughs> nobody ever talks about that. So mm. school us, Talia. Tell us what's Let's going on. In. Yes. So maybe, I mean, we're... The chat may be a little bit delayed, but if people can throw in what you've heard about the chemical dopamine into the chat, and we'll just see if it fits. We'll see you know, what your initial impressions are, what your initial understanding of it is. So if you can do that, I don't know if you have access to your keyboards, um, but dopamine is, it's a brain chemical, a neurotransmitter and, and, and a neuromodulator. So it actually, even though a, a tiny fraction of the chemicals in our brain uh, are dopamine, it has these wide reaching effects on the brain. And as you're gonna see, it has, it's responsible for a lot of our experience. Uh, so it's a very powerful chemical that influences the entire brain. And fundamentally dopamine is responsible for wanting, for us going after things in the external world. So that might include things like drive, motivation, that feeling of excitement, looking forward to something, like you want to do something, you want to take action to uh, get something. So it's pursuing a goal, uh, craving is involved with dopamine and libido, right? So a lot of what we consider our libido is that wanting, that drive, that craving mm -hmm. and essentially chasing a dream. So all of this, like there's a, a neuroscientist called Yak Pengsep and he wrote a book called um, Effective Neuroscience. And so he describes dopamine as like nuts and knowledge. So you imagine like a squirrel foraging <laughs> or a human being who's trying to find knowledge, who's pursuing something, worshiping a God uh, beyond space and time, looking up at the stars. There's a, an amazing book called The Molecule of More that really dives in. It's a very readable book and it mm -hmm. dives into what dopamine, what the flavor of dopamine is. 
And the author, Daniel Lieberman, talks about dopamine being an up chemical. So it causes us to like look up at to, into the sky oh, at things we don't currently have. Nice. You can contrast that with like down chemicals, the chemicals of the here and now, which are other neurotransmitters like serotonin, which is sort of our picnic blanket in the sun. You're, you know, you're lying there with people you like, you have a, enough mm -hmm. food, you feel safe, sated, satiated, and you don't really need to go anywhere, do anything. You're, you're good where you are. That's serotonin's flavor. Oxytocin is our love and bonding chemical. And we have our fight or flight chemicals like norepinephrine and epinephrine that are associated with anxiety and fear, but also excitement and uh, stimulation. And so those are examples of the here and now chemicals. They, they occur in the moment. They give us feedback about the present moment. Uh, and they're involved in our emotional experience. But dopamine is more about wanting the thing, going after the thing so that we can obtain it and have it and experience it in the here and now. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I love that. I love that. I've heard that it's the about to feel good hormone. Is that right? Exactly. It keeps us moving, right? Otherwise we would, you know, just be eat, like eat chilling on the couch. Yeah. Not move <laughs> and worry yeah, about like, the next meal. <laughs> like if you think about your serotonin system, right? it's like you're kind of lying on the picnic blanket and yeah. there's not a reason to get up. But yeah. if all of a sudden a swarm of flies come and ruin your picnic, you're going to get up and run and find a place mm -hmm. where there are no flies. So dopamine encourages us to change our current situation. Yeah. Oh, I love that. And yeah. to sort of tack. And so it actually is, there's so much more that's involved with like tenacity, mm -hmm. creativity, and we'll get into all that. But so you kind of see the difference, right? So dopamine is the chemical of wanting. And then the here and now chemicals are the chemicals of having right. and, and whatever that brings us. Now, uh, it's, you know, so dopamine, how it connects to our hormones is that our, so it relates to the hormone estrogen. So dopamine, when it goes into our brain, it gets filtered. So you think of it as like a drain, like your sink drain. It gets filtered and drained through a chemical called, and you don't have to remember this, but just know that there's a chemical called, uh, or an enzyme in the brain called COMT, C-O-M-T. Do you want to know what it stands for? Because patients always ask me what things stand for. So it stands for catechol uh, O-methyltransferase. Okay. <laughs> C-O-M-T. Just I'm know that there's an enzyme. Knowing that. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> and so this chemical, it drains dopamine. So when dopamine fills your sink or your brain, mm -hmm. it, it goes through this drain in it and it gets um, removed from your brain. The same chemical, though, also clears our hormones, norepinephrine and epinephrine, so our fight or flight chemicals, and it also clears estrogen. And when we have, if you think of that sink full of dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine, and estrogen, all of that has to go through the same drain, through the same enzyme. Estrogen sl slows the clearance of dopamine by about 30%. So how you can think of this is that when your sink is full and you have a lot of estrogen in there, your dopamine is going to be draining more slowly, mm -hmm. meaning it's going to stick around in your brain for a longer period of time. And it's going to influence your brain for a longer period of time. It's going to have more of an influence on your brain. So you can actually like in the menstrual cycle, see a lot of women will experience this pattern when their hormones change, right? So during ovulation or estrogen typically rises and then it drops and it rises again. And then right before we menstruate, there's this big drop of estrogen and, the, and progesterone as well. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people report feeling during ovulation that they're super motivated, libido goes up. Mm -hmm. This is the time to book things, to commit to projects. Like you wanna get it all done. You're, you're like under the kitchen sink, cleaning everything, scrubbing it. Do you know <laughs> you're, you're in that real drive mode? And then a lot of people can relate to right before your period, feeling like everything kind of turns gray, becomes meaningless. You feel super unmotivated, you know, very maybe emotional. You just want chocolate. You, know? you just want, yeah, exactly. And chocolate will boost your dopamine yeah. by about a hundred percent. So it doubles <laughs> your dopamine, but very momentarily. We'll talk about that too. Yeah. So yeah, so exactly. So you notice this up and down of the hormone estrogen influencing your dopamine levels. 
And then what happens in perimenopause, different things happen with estrogen. So sometimes you'll get a surge of estrogen. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you get a drop of estrogen. The issue with perimenopause for a lot of women is that it's very unpredictable. Right. So many of you may relate to this experience. Maybe you can like throw in the chat if you relate to this, but some day, some weeks, some days you're like, ah, everything's amazing. And other days it's like, I just feel completely unmotivated. I just want to sit on the couch all day. And, mm -hmm. and, and then that guilt, you know, that sometimes we feel with that. And then at, men, you know, once uh, men CCs, once we're officially in menopause, our estrogen find it's no longer going up and down and, you know, but there, it, it reaches a lower level than we may have experienced during our menstruating years. And so if somebody's, you know, so that's going to decrease overall our levels of dopamine. Now, estrogen itself has um, impacts on the brain and on our motivation and our libido. But this dopamine estrogen connection could be very significant for a lot of women because, uh, because as I said, it, it can increase your dopamine levels by about 30% by just slowing that clearance, that recycling process of dopamine. And so very common symptoms in perimenopause and menopause are brain fog, feeling like, you know, there's not a lot to look forward to. I, I just kind of want to scroll on the couch, uh, on my phone. Um, it's difficult to kind of muster the um, energy, or the motivation to do things creativity feels dampened, mood feels dampened. Very common symptoms are uh, this difficulty with finding words. And so you might look at somebody and know they're you're like, I know this person's name, but I just oh. can't bring it to, right? With yeah. All the time, all the time. It's yeah. So embarrassing. <laughs> or words, like, like somebody forgot, I think it, may, it was me maybe, I don't know who, but someone forgot the word for door. They're like, oh, the thing that's you open to get through holes in your house. <laughs> what is that thing? So, and this is because word recall and feeling articulate. It's it's like we use words to uh, forward motion, right? To to move yeah. through life, and so being highly articulate is part of dopamine's role. Mm -hmm. So we sort of feel this brain fog, this lack of drive. Um, lack of libido a lot of women describe you know when i when intercourse is initiated or or uh contact and connection is initiated i can get into it but the wanting of it is i'm not interested i'm not even thinking about it right um yeah, yeah. i'm not you know i'm not uh um you know I, i'm i'm having a lot of cravings maybe for chocolate and things like that and like a, and, and sugar things like that so these things will raise our dopamine momentarily and then and we can talk about this addictive process, but right. um, we get this dip in dopamine actually. So this is very common, right? So we get these symptoms. Th this happens like beef, you know, when perimenopause, menopause is not even uh, occurring yet. Like this happens to people in their twenties and their thirties, especially when we're overworked, we have a lot more stress going on. Um, but it definitely is a very common thing in our, uh, in, what was it you call it, Trace? You call it the third age. <laughs> yeah. Wise years. Yes. So we'll recap. So, so dopamine is like, so imagine you're walking outside and you see a plane flying in the sky. You look up and you're like, oh, that'd be so amazing to be on a plane. They're probably going to Mexico. They're going to lie on the beach and drink margaritas and they're going to go surfing. And okay, I, as soon as I get home, I'm going to book myself a flight and I'm going to go, right? Yeah. So that's the, that's the dopamine. That's like, you get an idea, you get inspired and you want to go and you do the thing. Yeah. And then you end up on the plane beside a crying baby and, you know, <laughs> and that's the here and now. Uh, okay. Um, and then contrast that with low dopamine. So dopamine is also responsible for tenacity. It's like going after something persisting. Mm -hmm. And so there's actually a study, we can highlight this in animals. So there's a study in rats in which if you give a rat uh, a little machine where they press a lever to get food, a rat will sort of learn. So they won't get a treat every time they press the lever, but the, like every four times they'll get one. Every 16 times they'll get one. And animals can learn and, and learn and dopamine is involved in learning, right? And that's why we reward our dogs and our kids with stuff <laughs> to get them to learn and to, to train them basically. So rats can be trained. Press the lever 16 times, you get a treat. So they'll sit there and they'll press. And they'll press, you know, uh, a few hundred times uh, an hour, whatever the time frame is. If you deplete rats' brains with dopamine, they they'll they'll press 
but they'll give up very quickly. So they won't have this tenacity to persist. Wow. They'll, they'll settle for the random mouse chow because it's just as good, you know? <laughs> yeah. um, and so there's this sort of like, okay, like this drop in willpower. Mm -hmm. And and we think of willpower as like you have it or you don't. We don't often mm -hmm. think about willpower as a muscle that gets drained yeah. throughout the day. Yeah. Right. So we have uh, our dopamine uh, circuit in our brain. So brain circuit is sort of this well-worn pathway that dopamine travels along that gets us to do things, to behave in certain ways. So we have two main ones it, that related to dopamine. One is the dopamine desire circuit. Okay, this involves like the lower part of our brain, the more animal part. So you're uh, on a sugar-free plan <laughs> and you see a bunch of cupcakes and you're kind of hungry and the do do dopamine desire uh, circuit is like, eat the cupcakes, eat the cupcakes, do it. And then your hand the reaches sugar out. Fire, the sugar fire the dopamine receptors. It's so sugar gives us a dopamine hit. Yeah, that, and, and, uh, and so our, yeah, we're, we're highly motivated to eat sugar. And this is partly evolutionarily because it was rare to have sugar in our environment. So if you got it in nature, you should eat all of it that you can because you're probably not going to see it again. You come across a ripe fruit tree, go crazy, right? That's our dopamine desire circuit, especially when we're hungry mm -hmm. and when our blood sugar is low. We'll talk about that too. So, you know, you see the cupcakes, your hand reaches out and it's, it's in your face, right? There's, there isn't really a lot of thought. And, uh, and that's just sort of this animalistic, like this is our dopamine desire circuit at work. We also have the dopamine control circuit that involves the prefrontal cortex. So the part of the brain that I think we consider us, you know, it's the part that thinks, that plans. It's the part of the brain involved in executive functioning, which is the ability to follow this podcast, you know, to, to figure, to maybe put images into your mind of what we're talking about. It's also the, uh, the ability for us to like start a project and bring it to completion to, Right. So if your sink is, if your dishes are, are done and everything's kind of put away, your dopamine uh, control circuit is working, your executive functioning is working. And so the dopamine control circuit involves the prefrontal cortex. So that's where you see the cupcakes and your desire circuit's going want, want, want. But your control circuit is saying, you know, I had a cupcake yesterday. Uh, I think I'm going to go have that. Uh, you know, cheese or turkey breast or something that's right beside the cupcakes because I'm trying to cut out sugar for 30 days. So this is the part of the brain that like, it, it, it controls the desire of dopamine. This is what is often uh, under functioning or needs more energy in uh, things like ADHD. Mm -hmm. right? So somebody with ADHD may have more difficulty with impulse control, completing tasks, initiating tasks because their dopamine control circuit lacks energy. Now, there, there's actually a study, and you can deplete this control circuit, right? So we, uh, we kind of drain it like a battery throughout the day. So think of all the decisions you're making all day, all the executive functioning that's required. And, you know, usually most of my patients by three o'clock, they're like craving sugar, feeling depleted, can't find words for things. Emotional regulation is difficult. So you're feeling like either very irritable or really sad or anxiety is ramping up that's often when we just feel like how many more hours to go okay two more hours you know i need I'm a donut and a coffee and felt reruns <laughs> exactly and as you get home and you're just like like done you know and so there's a study where they took participants the two groups of people and they kind of played a trick on them they put them in a room so one at a time they went into a room and half of them and there were a bowl of radishes raw radishes and a bowl of freshly baked cookies okay so half of the participants they said to them and they didn't know this was part of the of the uh experiment half the participants they said help yourself to the cookies we just bake them while you're waiting you know have as many as you like the other participants the other half they said we bake the cookies for the staff and researchers, so please don't touch them, but you're welcome to have radishes if you're hungry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so they watch them through a one-way mirror, which is really funny when you see these kind of experiments because people yeah. don't know they're being watched. And so they, the radish people, they would like, they didn't eat any of the cookies, so they their dopamine control circuit was working, but they would wander over. They didn't think they're being watched. They go pick up a cookie and like sniff it, 
<laughs> look at it longingly <laughs> and put it down <laughs> they're just they're, they're they were holding on hmm. okay so now the real experiment begins they put them in a room with a test that they had to do and the test had no solution there's no right answer and so it was impossible to solve so they wanted to see how long they would try to get the right answer for before they give up the right the right response to this test is to give up but how long do you persist what's the, what how you know uh how much tenacity do you have how much dopamine is still available to you to to persevere and so the group that were allowed to eat the cookies they lasted about 20 minutes and the group that were only allowed to eat the radishes and had to withstand their desire for the cookies they lasted less than half that time so wow. if you think about yeah like all the decisions we're making in the day and this mm -hmm. you know supports this idea of like First of all, can we make sure that the dopamine control sugar has as much energy as possible, especially in the perimenopause, menopausal stage of life when we might not have as much dopamine available baseline. It's sort of like when your iPhone battery starts to not go to its full charge anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, Can we make sure at least that we're charging it every night and regularly throughout the day so that we have that battery available to us? And can we look at the thing? Can we make sure there's no background apps <laughs> stealing battery energy? And yeah. you know, therefore, like automating things is really helpful. But this also speaks to the idea of willpower, right? So it's not something that uh, it's something that we can conserve, conserve and manage throughout the day. And there, a big way to do that is by regulating our blood sugar. So making sure that because that is what the prefrontal cortex feeds off of and if our blood sugar drops that's usually when we get this drop in that dopamine control circuit in our prefrontal cortex activation where we start to feel emotionally dysregulated we become more like the inner four-year-old right we, we we feel irritable we feel angry we just want cookies like i just want to go home you know <laughs> so i just want to sit on the couch and watch tv so the more we can keep that prefrontal cortex going the less we experience those crashes and the more we feel like okay i, I have more energy available to me um to so, how, so how practically what kind of diet or nutritional needs um are you looking at in terms of being able to keep the blood sugar stable the protein tracy the you talk about protein. this all the time we are all about protein in the reshape method and I'll tell you why the right, oh, much more. So dopamine is made out of uh, an amino acid tyrosine. Okay, so it starts with amino acid phenylalanine, gets me into tyrosine, gets me into L-dopa, which is a drug that they use for people with Parkinson's who are uh, deficient in dopamine in, in some ways, and then that gets made into dopamine. So if you think of like the more you provide the ingredients, the more the more dopamine you have potentially available to you in your brain. Mm. And tyrosine, phenylalanine, these come from, yeah, dietary protein. And uh, we also need vitamin B6 and iron to make those conversion steps happen. And so somebody with iron deficiency um, might experience a lot of these like low dopamine symptoms and not even know it, you know, they're like, oh yeah, I think uh, I have trouble absorbing iron or my iron is always kind of low in my blood work, but I don't really, I know it makes you tired, but I, I actually feel okay. And when we actually dig into some of their symptoms, we find that, yeah, the, oh yeah, word recall. Um, yeah, I'm noticing there's a lot more kind of disorder in my house. I'm feeling more overwhelmed by things. I'm, I'm not feeling inspired by things. Um, I just, I feel a little bit lethargic or less excited to do things after work and to engage in hobbies and to get out my painting supplies and do different things. Right. I think um, that mm -hmm. iron conversation is so important. Maybe you can come back and talk to us about it because yeah. most women are iron deficient and we're being told you're in the range. <laughs> right. Totally. Yeah. 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 You want to get your ferritin in your blood work about 80 if possible. That sometimes takes a little bit of work, but and, and figuring out, you know, how to do that, because there's different reasons why some might have low iron, but that's where we, we want to be. And then with protein, so it, it depends on my patients, but sometimes I'll put people on a pretty high protein diet, depending on their health goals. So if they're experiencing, so a common pattern I see in a lot of my uh, female patients, especially in their forties, fifties, 
if they're experiencing maybe some weight gain, you know, that, and maybe that's their main concern. Um, and they're, ex and they're really like kind of looking after their nutrition throughout the day, but then they find that around that 4 PM window, or even after dinner, they end up like at the bottom of a bag of chips. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and then what they, so what they often do is feel bad about it and then restrict in the morning and they do intermittent fasting, very common. So what I'm trying to teach them to do is to regulate their blood sugar to support their prefrontal cortex activation, which, and, and re remove this need for willpower. When our blood sugar steady, we feel this sort of grounded, focused, calm throughout the day. Mm -hmm. We don't, you know, think of like a sailboat on the seas, like we're on calm, stable water versus like ups and downs and not the thing with blood sugar too, is that we can impact it hours before we experience the symptoms of it. So not a lot of us will intuitively make the connection and not a lot of us will connect, you know, the quality of our breakfast with that bag of chips in the afternoon. It just not, they're happening too far apart in time and space. And we're not really, mm -hmm. and we usually feel fine in the morning. I don't really feel hungry. I can eat, mm -hmm. I could just have a coffee with some collagen, you know, and, and get through it. And, um, but so we're, I'm often encouraging my patients, a high protein, bre high protein breakfast, emphasize protein at lunchtime. And then many require protein rich snack around 4 PM. And sometimes the, the guidelines are as simple as you know, just add protein to the thing that you're craving. So if you want to go get a donut at Tim Hortons, you know, rather than trying to like moralize it and suppress that and not do it, eat your donut, but add a decent serving of protein to it. So maybe a decent amount of nut butter or a couple of hard boiled eggs. I know that doesn't really go with a donut, but <laughs> this idea, you know, yeah. and, and that it, it gives us this, this nourishment that is more likely to sustain us to stop that, so like often what will happen, right? When we think of like what we might term binge eating or emotional eating, we often feel like I, I'm never really hitting that satiety point. And protein is helpful for just shutting off that cycle. Like my, I was traveling in Brazil with a friend and we had this saying that was like, when in doubt, eat meat. Because we'd be walking around the village we were staying in like where oh, I just, I feel like I want something. I don't know what to eat. Like, do I want an acai bowl? Do I want ice cream? What do I want? And then if we, if we just ate meat, that would go away. And so we'd have to remind ourselves like when in doubt, eat meat, <laughs> just yeah. to shut off that, right. that feeling of craving. It almost is that simple. I read this incredible book. <laughs> I don't know if you've heard of it called Eat Like the Animals, where they yeah. talk about how we are actually driven by this protein appetite. All, yes. all organisms on the planet are yes. driven by protein appetite. Um, and that there's a threshold that the body's trying to get to every day, right? Yes. For all these reasons that you're talking about. And if you don't meet that threshold with good sources of protein, you're going to, there's still protein in a bag of chips, right? Not much. Yeah, exactly. Though. You're going to keep on, on, on pumping throughout the day like a, until like you get a your 20 grams. Until yeah. You that threshold is fascinating. And that's, that's we really uh -huh. go into that in quite a lot of detail in the reshape method as well, because for so many things, it's about the protein, right? And we don't make the connection because it's not something we crave. Like, never in my life have I ever been like oh, I'm gonna go warm up that cold chicken breast in the fridge that's really what I want <laughs> carbs I crave carbs I want to eat potatoes I want uh, so we have to that that's a little bit where we have to use uh, almost like our dopamine uh, control circuit to strategize and to set up that system of eating protein regularly because we're not going to necessarily crave it or feel that in our bodies and, and until you start training it Mm -hmm. And are we craving the carbs because of the direct effect on lighting up those dopamine receptors? That yeah, you get a dopamine hit from the carbs. So, well, and yeah, we're going to talk about this pain pleasure balance, but, um, and how that relates to blood sugar too. But yeah, like we're craving and, and often salt, right? So like chicken is salty, like our, our meat sources, our protein sources in nature are, are the ways that we might have obtained salts. So the bag of chips kind of represents that umami salty flavor mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and then yeah like look at your uh, bag of chips and look at see the protein content it'll be like 0.2 grams per serving if you're if that that threshold wants 20 grams for that meal or snack just you know 
what is that? A hundred servings, right? So yeah. that's why we end up at the bottom of the bag. And then we're still like, where's the, and I have this experience like, and I, and I never, it's in the moment again, it's real. Even if you know, it's hard to make the connection. Like I went for vegan food and I had a delicious vegan Caesar salad with a friend. And then I went home and I felt full. Like my stomach was full of food. And I went home and I just finished an entire bag of crackers I had in my cupboard. And, and I, then I was like, oh, right. I didn't, there was not a lot of protein in my meal. Yeah. Boiled again. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but you're right, Tracy. So yeah, so there is a, we, we eat to hit a protein threshold. There's some evidence for that. And so I'll tell, you know, and I, like yesterday with all, virtually every single patient, we talked about protein and, and we, you know, it, it's a good idea, a good experiment to do for yourself is to get download an app like Chronometer or MyFitnessPal and just track your protein for a few days and see how much you're getting, how much you need. I think it depends again on your goals. If you're, if you have a, if, if you are making a lot of decisions, so you have a, like, you, you know, you're, you're, you're managing a family and you have your job and your job is fairly stressful. And then there's other things like, stress. So baseline, uh, existence in modern society is stressful. A lot of people are like, oh, I'm not stressed. I love my job. I love my family. Well, it's your, your brain is working more than let's say it was designed to evolutionarily, right? Like we were designed to kind of chill most of the time and then to actively work about 15 hours a week. So if you're working more than 15 hours a week, then I think <laughs> that we can consider that stress. Right. Mm -hmm. And then if you actually are feeling stressed, which is more, I think what we mean by stress in our society is more of like a, ten, a, a tension and an anxiety about getting things done and, and an overwhelm. Right. And, a, and about stress. things yeah. out of our control that are happening around us. And yeah. Like it's that thinking. treading water of like, okay, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not, the yeah. I, price. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm doing, it. I'm treading water. My head's above the water or maybe yeah. you're, you're, you're starting to, you know, and you're, you're still trying. So if, if that's the case and you're experiencing symptoms of like slow metabolic rate, uh, feeling that crash at 4 PM, waking up in the middle of the night, that's a big one. So in maintenance, insomnia cravings and feeling like, you know, I'm, I'm good all day. And then I, and then I, uh, everything kind of falls off the rails. Like my desired dopamine circuits take over. Then I often encourage people to hit at least hundred grams. Now, this is not individual advice. Sometimes we do a gram of protein per pound of body weight. And again, it really depends. Um, there's been some talk of how protein is not high protein diets are not good for the kidneys, but there was a study in bodybuilders where they were consuming, it was three grams per pound of body weight. And they were doing this for several months and then they crossed over. So the same individual went on a lower protein diet. And then, and then they looked at their kidney function and there was no, there's no change. So if there is decreased kidney function, if someone has kidney disease, that's a different story, mm -hmm. but generally that high amount of protein is, is okay. And, you know, you want a certain amount of protein for basic bodily function because everything is protein in our body, a, a large, you know, besides being water or fat, all of our enzymes, all of the structure of our body is all protein. So you want to be able to repair and replenish that. And for all the enzymes to work, you want to, many of you are in, um, wanting to be in an anabolic state to build muscle and to put on bone mass and to support brain mass, all that's anabolism. So building the body. And in that case, you want a little bit extra protein, right? Because that's going into muscle synthesis. And then if you're trying to regulate your dopamine, blood sugar and manage stress, then that's even more protein. So you know, a lot of the dietary guidelines are based on like, what's the amount of protein you need to like, not experience muscle wasting. Well, we can do better than that for ourselves, right? Like Absolutely. we want, <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And I say muscle at peri and menopause, it's like walking up a down escalator. Mm -hmm. If you're not, if you're just keeping up, right, you're stagnant. You've got to, you, that should, trajectory is down people. <laughs> You got to do in yeah. terms of movement, lifestyle, and and nutrition to keep up with it because you are losing it because of age and hormone related factors. Yeah. And so I think so. People are like I eat an egg for breakfast. So an yeah. egg is about six grams of protein. Right. And so we're looking at twenty five. Right. You're about yeah twenty twenty to thirty. 
20 to yeah. 30. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and, and it depends how many meals a day you have and, and that kind of thing, right? So if you're just having three meals a day, then 20 grams might is on the, quite the lower end, right? Because that's going to give you just yeah. 60 in, in total. So if you're thinking of getting 100 mm -hmm. in your day, then yeah, then so like a, a useful way to do it, like I said, is to is to download a, a tracking app that tracks your macros and forget about the calories and all the other stuff and, and don't worry what they're telling you to eat. Just look at the protein and just see what you're getting. So I'll tell people like, just track uh, as you're eating normally for about three days, see what you're getting, and then try to increase it and hit a hundred and see what that feels like. So first of all, see what it feels like in terms of satiety, how you might even do that, because it usually involves having protein sources readily available. So pre-cooked chicken breast, hard boiled eggs, even protein, but you know, I, I have a patient I just saw yesterday who's um, in the postpartum phase. And I was like, look, like, Let's just simplify things. Let's just do protein powder. It's not ideal in terms of the most natural diet, but it's something you can throw into a cup of water, mix, you know, mix around, chug back, and then go on with all the things you have to do, you know? So it's like, we're sort of working formula one here, you know, yes. roadside assistance really quick. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the, the, let's talk about the pain pleasure balance, because that's also yeah. really interesting too, is, is a way to improve our dopamine regulation. So when we uh, get a hit of dopamine. There's substances in our world like sugar, chocolate, sex, uh, cocaine, methamphetamine. <laughs> There's these substance gambling that will hit our dopamine. So you eat some chocolate, your dopamine goes up about 100%, so it doubles. Amazing. That's why we love chocolate. But what happens is we get a crash below baseline of dopamine. So if your dopamine is normally like a five out of 10, you eat chocolate, goes to a 10. And then for a while, it goes to a three. Now, if you really observe this closely, you can watch it in action, um, especially when there's something called invariable reward, which is where sometimes you get the reward and sometimes you don't, you don't know when that's gonna happen. So I, have, I tell this story because I observed it so clearly and I was like, this is, that, this is it, this is, this is dopamine invariable reward schedules. There's a kind of trail mix. I forget what it's called, but it has cranberry, peanuts, almonds, and then these little chocolate chunks. Oh, I know the one you mean. It's so good. <laughs> so you get a handful. <laughs> and if you're hungry, it's, it's rewarding. So you get a handful and there's like two pieces of chocolate and your dopamine's like, woohoo. And then it goes down and you're like craving. But you don't know, you don't really, yeah, you don't feel it as pain. You feel it as I want more trail mix. Yeah. Okay. So you put your hand in the bag again. This time it's like all peanuts. Oh, I'm still in craving. So then I put my hand in the bag again. I get one chocolate. Ooh, okay. And then pain. And then I get, then I get three chocolates. Woohoo. So I'm at the bottom of the, I ate the whole thing. Like that, that is going to keep you going. It's, it's the way that casinos hook you in. Yeah. Um, and then we can actually hack that for a benefit. And so one of the things is if you want to motivate yourself to do something and you kind of like that thing, don't reward yourself every time. So for example, if you're, if you want to do uh, your workouts, Tracy's workouts, and you normally put on some music that you really like, listen to music sometimes and not other times. Um, because it will, it will, uh, when we, when we add too many dopamine boosting things in a predictable way, it starts to decrease our enjoyment of the, th of the thing, of the working out. Mm -hmm. And so what you might want to do is just flip a coin and decide, you know, and so maybe like after Tracy's workout, you have a, 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 an exciting snack. So maybe you flip a coin and if it's heads, you take a snack. And if it's tails, you just say, okay, not today. And you yeah. keep that uh, experience and that enjoyment mm -hmm. of the workouts fresh in your mind. Um, but so this pain pleasure balance, what, so this is where a good example of this, you, you get out Instagram, you're scrolling on your phone and you see something cool. And so you get this like, oh, wow, that's really cool. And then your dopamine kind of goes to baseline. And then it slowly comes up and then you see something equally cool come by your screen again. You don't get as much of a hit from that because now you've sensitized your dopamine receptors. And so this is like, you know, the teenager who plays video games all the time. And there's a book called uh, Dopamine Nation by Anna Lamke, she's a psychiatrist and she works with addiction. And so she describes a patient she had who was, I think he's in his twenties, he's in university, he's studying computer engineering and he's like, I'm so bored with my program, not interested in what's happening. It's really hard for me to motivate myself to do it. And I don't really know why. 
and I am playing video games basically all day. And that's really the only thing that excites me. So she puts her patients on something called a dopamine fast. So for 30 days, you can reset your dopamine receptors. So she had him cut out his video games for 30 days. And then, you know, if there's other low hanging fruit, like if you're like, well, you know, sugar is sort of my thing or alcohol is my thing or um, porn, you know, gambling, whatever it is, right? Uh, scrolling on my phone. So she had him cut all that stuff out for 30 days. The initial couple weeks, very painful. And then eventually he's like, oh, I'm actually getting excited about my program again. It's, it's interesting to me. I'm, I'm experiencing it in a different way. So that's one thing that we can do. If we really feel, and I'll do this sometimes, like I'll, I'll cut out social media or I'll change it up on my phone, maybe take the apps off the main screen of my phone just to change that, that um, experience. Yeah. Um, in, mm -hmm. in the reshape method, we, we also, we recommend that you have a social media free day. I take uh -huh. a media free day every weekend. Mm -hmm. And just as you say, like the benefits of that, it feels like I've been on holiday and it's only been yeah. 24 hours. And then when you see it again, you're like, oh yes. yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And and then you feel less like that that I'm not happy, but I'm still doing it because yeah. doing it is just bringing me basically to my baseline, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You feel like you have more control over it mm -hmm. and over your life and over your decision-making. Yeah, you feel, and then you're like, I'm actually, I'm excited by the idea of going for a walk and, and looking at the trees. Those are more exciting. Those are more exciting to me because my dopamine uh, receptors are reset. Like my yeah. levels are, are yeah. back to their baseline. So mm -hmm. I'm getting excited by, uh, think, you know, normal natural things not things that were designed to hijack these right. pathways in our brain um, like sugar social media and all these things the other thing you can do so we have this pe pleasure pain balance right so every time we so it we pay for our pleasure spikes with this drop in dopamine so there's really no way that you can uh keep your dopamine high all the time right our brain wants to be in balance all the time and so that's like, you know, you, you're, you're a hunter gatherer, you walk by a berry bush and you get so excited. You're like, oh, those berries were delicious. I'm going to come back here every day. And you remember, and then you keep going back to the berry bush. And then it just becomes part of your, the landscape of your life. It's, oh, there's the berry bush again. Love that bush, but like, I don't care. You know, <laughs> if the, if all of a sudden someone came and ate all the berries, I'd be, I'd be mad. And I would have actually, I've experienced pain. So this pleasure, pleasure pain balance is interesting because you can actually improve your pleasure if you do the opposite, if you push on the side of pain. Mm. So there's a study uh, with cold water therapy. <laughs> so they, uh, they put, um, I think it was male participants in some cold water and they had them sit there for, for an hour. Um, and their dopamine increased by about 500% and stayed high throughout the day. So uh, kind of an extreme, but you know, now there's all this stuff where like the Wim Hof uh, world where you have people doing ice baths. Um, I'll, I'll kind of do a burst of cold at the end of my shower if I'm feeling sluggish and I kind of just want to feel more excited. I personally, I do cold water surfing in the winter. So <laughs> it's a very dopamine boosting activity. Mm -hmm. um, but the, and so you think of things like exercise or this idea of discipline, like of, you know, a putting the body under um, helpful stressors that uh, are, it's not like chastising. It's not like, you know, giving ourselves pain, but it's like doing something that's not rewarding often will give us a reward, you know? So I think like yeah. the cold therapy, like, I mean, you can try it. You can put your shower on cold for the last 30 seconds. <laughs> just dance around in it i'm gonna try that and see how you feel yeah mm. usually the, first you get this hit of norepinephrine so you feel really euphoric and then uh and, and increase heart rate you feel like woohoo and then you'll feel kind of like alert and red and 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 better you know and and like your brain has more energy and, and more circulation um and so there's people like kind of addicted to this practice because they push on pain but eventually they get the pleasure hit. So right. they just, their brain's now associated that connection. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is something you can try. So high protein, cold showers, um, dopamine fasts. And so I realize I'm not presenting any exciting solutions, <laughs> but it's just the way it is. Um, let me see what else I wanted to say. Um, 
And I guess, you know, there's herbs. So the, 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 the thing is there are supplements that can boost dopamine. So if you do a Google search, you'll find L-tyrosine, right? Which is the precursor to dopamine. You'll find um, uh, Macuna purines. And these are helpful. And then some people with ADHD are prescribed uh, stimulants, right? Like Ritalin. So these are, are helpful, but just like we learned the rule, right? You get a hit of dopamine and then you get a drop. So if somebody is really struggling, let's say you need to do a podcast like this and you just, you need the brain power. You can, you can use these tools, just recognizing that there will be a downside eventually and that they'll be short-lived. So some of these supplements, they have about 30 sec, uh, 30 minute duration. So Macuna, you get, you get a hit of dopamine, you feel way more alert and then it kind of wears off. Um, so the cool therapy actually does prolong your dopamine release because of that pain pressure, uh, balance. But there's other herbs that could be helpful, like bacopa, lion's mane mushroom, um, and uh, rhodiola also supports prefrontal cortex activity. And so we'll sometimes you use can that. Pop these in the chat afterwards. So. Sure. Yeah. We yeah we like you know and and it's like it's a little bit of a trial and error like you you want to make sure that there you're not on a medication that could interact with these things maybe consult with a naturopathic right. doctor or somebody who prescribes them just to see but uh, they're pretty low side effect right they're available over the counter in a health food store um, I think though you know what I, what I often say what a, a colleague of mine actually introduced um, as an idea is if you're dabbling for about three weeks and not noticing any changes then maybe consult a professional because sometimes having more of that uh, view of how it all connects together might be the thing that you're missing, right? Because we, like, patients will come in, they're like, yeah, I'm trying this, I'm trying that. And I'm not, I just don't know. Maybe I'm on a bunch of supplements, but I'm not sure what's working. I'm not sure, you know, uh, if I need this stuff, I'm, I don't know, you know, I, I need a strategy, essentially. I need somebody to kind of look at my case and put it together and say, hey, these are the three things you need to be taking, uh, or that would be helpful for you. But these are some herbs that could, um, support that executive functioning and also buffer our body from the effects of stress. Um, and then you have, by, by, you know, B6, iron, vitamin D, all important for dopamine synthesis. So looking to see if those are deficient and, uh, you know, particularly the birth control pill can deplete vitamin B6. So if you're taking that or have for a long period of time in your life, then B6 may be something to consider supplementing with. Um, but yeah, there's not a lot of these like easy, like this is what brings your dopamine yeah. up, right? L-tyrosine, just take it. And you're going to feel better. Yeah. But now like because of the hormonal changes, maybe this is a time in our lives, especially in the perimenopausal phase where things are going up and down with estrogen. Maybe this is the time when we do a couple of supplements to help stabilize that, that roller coaster, you know? Um, and, and, and then a big one is let's support adrenal function so that the, so that the adrenal glands can make those, hor those sex hormones like estrogen and progesterone to at least establish a, a baseline. So it really is. It's a whole body thing, right? You can't just, mm. you know, <laughs> one quick hit. I know we all want the easy fixes, right? But oh, I know. just like when it comes to reshaping your body and alignment, the same thing when it comes to to hormones, everything that you're doing is affecting everything else. There's a cascade, right? Which is why yeah. I think it is so important to, to see a naturopath or some other kind of holistic practitioner who's going to look at the whole person and not just, oh, yeah. menopause, it must be the sex hormones. Would it oh. be that easy, right? <laughs> exactly. And then I think my final thing, which I, I just remember too, is so there, you know, we all know the person who's very dopamine driven. So this is the person that here, here's an example from uh, the book Molecule of More, um, a woman that uh, she got hired to run a company or to take over like an executive role in the company that was in total disarray. So everything is just out of order. So she went in very high dopamine person. She restored it all to order. Now the company is this utopia. Everyone's happy working there. It's an amazing environment. It's very efficient. And she got bored. And so then now she, she went off to another company that was in total disaster mode, you know, in, in a disaster state and then went to fix that place. So dopamine is very important, but also so are our here and now chemicals. And we need to be able to enjoy what we have, right? So mm -hmm. the person who can book the flight, get excited about the trip to Mexico, 
and then be on the beach with the margarita and take in what that experience is like. The person that goes in and fixes the company and experiences the high from that. And then instead of feeling that low and that sort of like, okay, now what? It's like, let me just like bask in how happy everyone is here, the fruits of my labor, you know? And so balancing those two things, you know, so using dopamine to get us to improve our lives and then really experiencing the here and now. Right. And right. So people like, why don't I get excited about a yoga class? Because yoga doesn't really, or like those kind of experiences where you're with people, you're taking care of your body, you're really in your body. That doesn't give you a dopamine hit necessarily. Um, unless you feel that kind of achievement of like, I checked it off my list so that you might want to build that in. Mm -hmm. But what it does do is deliver you serotonin, oxytocin here and now chemicals, because people are like, I, don't, I never get excited to go to, to yoga. I get excited to sit with a bag of chips on the couch. Uh, but after I do yoga, I feel so much better. After I, I sit and dedicate a couple hours to painting or reading, I feel happy. I'm really happy that I did it. So building in that, knowing that we're not necessarily going to be motivated to do things, but to be able to appreciate those here and now chemicals is also very important. Um, and there's a, a Jungian analyst, Esther Harding, that has a quote about that. And she says, like, she writes about sort of um, women and, and phases and the moon. And she says, you know, our, in our later years in life, our drive and creativity, instead of being external, sort of turns inward. And it, that energy almost builds within us. And so, you know, yes, if you have brain fog and cravings and mood issues, then we want to help with that. But there's this other lens to it where it's like our, our energy and our rhythm may change as well. And we might become more focused on here and now things. Um, and because, you know, and, and maybe this is something you can answer in the chat, who here feels like ha happiness at this stage in your life is coming from being present a lot more of the time, if you're noticing that more, like maybe in your twenties, it was about like drive and achievement. And now it's like taking the time to be present, centered in the body, really being in the moment is maybe now what you're noticing is bringing more happiness. And this is, you know, a theme that we, <laughs> that we hear about, right. Especially in spiritual circles is like, uh, let's like, let's uh, be able to take it in, you know, to sit in, look down, you know, with the down molecules, um, savor the taste of the cake, you know. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so important. Well, thank you so much for coming to speak to us today. Thank this you. Is, it's really, I love this. Um, I, I think it is a hormone that is just not spoken about enough. Mm -hmm. And it really, it drives us, <laughs> it drives yeah. so many of the decisions we make, the good and the bad decisions. So thank you so much for coming to chat to us and bringing our attention to this. And if you could let people know, do you work with people outside of Ontario as well or only in Ontario? Only in Ontario in one-to-one -one practice, but I have uh, some DIY programs that people outside Ontario can access and I'm, I'm building them as I go, but there's one on nutrition and mental health that might be helpful. And there's also one on, um, it's called You Ate Less on the Moon, but it's sort of about me metabolism and uh, body image, weight loss, sort of that world. And, and so these are like, you know, 30-ish dollar courses that you could grab Thank if you're you. outside Ontario. Yeah, but one-to-one -one is only, unfortunately, Ontario, just due to licensing stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, if you can put the links to that in the chat, and I... Sure. I'm definitely going to be making an appointment and coming to see you. Oh, nice. Yes. <laughs> Get some balancing going on. Um, and it would be so wonderful if you could come and talk to us again. There's just of course. so many topics that I wanted to do, you know, be off. And if I could get your reading list, oh my goodness, I just love these. I'll put, yeah, I'll put the books in the chat. And I also did a, a more in depth podcast on this topic recently, right before our podcast episode, I think. And so I can put the link there if someone wants, if you really want more, <laughs> if you want Fantastic. to hear more about the rats and yeah, all that. Yeah, yeah. Please. And I will also put the link to the podcast we did because Tyler yeah. interviewed me last week all about the stuff that we do in this group and in the Reshape Method. And it just pulled together my whole philosophy and outlook on, on moving and audacious aging. Mm -hmm. It was such fun chatting. It was with so you. fun. Yeah. yeah, it was really fun. It was great. Speaking yeah. <laughs> 
geeking about alignment and biomechanics yes. is awesome. Yeah, but, if you're not inspired by the end, if your dopamine's not racing by the end of that podcast to work with Tracy, then I don't know what we'll get in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Well, thank you so, so much. If you have any questions, I know a lot of people said that they were going to come and watch the replay. Mm -hmm. So please just um, do hashtag replay and tag Talia if you have a specific question. Would it be okay if you hop in and answer if people have any specific questions? Sure. If you can just come and look in, that would be awesome. Yeah. If you put the at sign in Talia, my name should appear. And I am in the group. I'm Talia JCM. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Well, thank you so, so much. Just one short thing. And it's really made a difference to me about, I love the mention of the decision fatigue, right? That mm -hmm. that's the opposite end of it. Mm -hmm. And um, just the whole idea of like having a simple wardrobe. Yeah. <laughs> make you less don't decisions. Have to make decisions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wardrobe decisions every day. That has been, I cannot tell you how such a simple thing like that has mm -hmm. just allowed me to focus on other things in my day. <laughs> yeah, and systems. Like we didn't get into this, but my uh, my partner, I'm pretty sure has ADHD. And so this is like, and so I'm really noticing how it plays out. Like for what I think doing the dishes looks like versus what his idea is. And having systems, doing it the same way every time, it might seem boring, but a lot of our life, like 70% of our life is routine tasks and like getting the dishes right, getting your cooking right, getting your wardrobe mm -hmm. right in that sense. So if that stuff is just automatic, then, yeah. then you can save the prefrontal cortex for the stuff that matters, like getting excited to put your paint supplies out and doing that and getting a book club together, like whatever it is, is important to you. Um, instead of wasting that energy on like, like, you know, I got to figure out where to put this dish now and okay, I pre-cooked my protein, but, and also knowing that things take time to get used to, right? So when you're batch cooking, maybe the first time you don't do a very good job, but by the 10th mm -hmm. time now, you don't even think about it. You're listening to a podcast and you, you kind of actually even enjoy it. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Awesome. Well, thank you so, so much for coming to chat with us today. Wonderful, so wonderful. Yeah. And we'll speak to you soon. I hope. Thank you. Bye. Bye.